Hello, welcome. This is another episode of The Tracker here on City TV. Today's episode is a special edition because we have a very, very special guest speaking to her from her base all the way in the US. She's Ghana's record holder in the triple jump. Don't go anywhere. We'll take a short break. When we come back, I'll introduce my guest and then we start the conversation. <laughs> My search led me to the study of the spiritual forces with which all of us are blessed. And it was in this field that I came upon a clue which has enabled me to help millions of people to find their earthly destinies. I want to describe my discovery in the simplest terms possible because it will reveal to you why it is true that whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve, regardless of how many times you may have failed in the past or how lofty your aims and hopes may be. The only thing that I see that is distinctly different about me is I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill. You might have more talent than me, you might be smarter than me, but if we get on the treadmill together, <laughs> right, there's two things. You're getting off first, yeah. or I'm gonna die. It's really that simple. I want to represent an idea. I want to represent possibilities. I want to represent the idea that you really can make what you want. That's just, I just believe that. I, I believe that I can create whatever I want to create. Everything starts with a vision, roadmap, goals, destiny. How many of y'all got goals? How many of y'all got a road map laid down? How many of you know where you're going in one year, five years, ten years, and a step-by-step -step program to get there? My mom would always say to me, don't worry about what it looks like right now. You got to see yourself down the road. I know it's tough that we live in a neighborhood, but start going online and seeing what it looks like down the road. So no matter what you're seeing right now, you stay focused on the prize. Now let me give you an example of what I mean. My mom dropped me off in college. The first thing I did was this. I came. Tore out a sheet of paper, I sat down and I wrote, I said, what do I want to do in college? What do I want to accomplish in college? I started writing it down. All American, all conference, dean's list, graduated in four years, master's degree, NFL, four or five in the 40. So I took that piece of paper, taped it on the side of my bed, and every morning I would visit my future, and every night I'd visit my future. Now here's the funny thing. My teammates saw that for the first time, they couldn't stop laughing. This skinny guy, and you think you're going to accomplish all that? We know what we call that, right? Dream killers. Dream killers will come in the form of alcohol, in the form of drugs, in the form of bad attitude, in the form you think you know it all. It'll stop a dream in a heartbeat. But I didn't let that bother me. I saved the course. And slowly but surely, here come all conference. Here come Dean's List. Here come four or five in the 40. Here come a phone call from the Philadelphia Eagles. Vision. That's the power of a vision. The problem with most people, the problem with most people is that you're not obsessed with improvement. You're obsessed with making money. You're obsessed with taking your business to the next level. And can I be honest with you guys? When you become obsessed with improvement, I will spend more time learning in Australia than I will speaking. I'm going to say it again because you missed it. I will spend more time sitting under people. All right, welcome back. This is The Tracker on City TV. My name is Fentio Tahiru Fentio. As I indicated, if you can't see, 
you probably can see my guest already and if you know her you would already know who that is but for those that don't know her she's Ghana's record holder in the triple jump my guest today is Nadia Eke. Nadia hi how are you doing? I'm good how are you and thank you guys for having me by the way. Yeah yeah I mean uh, it's, 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 it's been a while um, I think you were last year two years ago I believe. I know. Yeah it was like what 2018 2018 yes that was i think that was the last time you came here for an interview and that's that's a while back um yeah it's yeah. been a while but i've been busy mm -hmm. even with COVID. i said it's been a while but i've been busy yeah mm -hmm. okay um i mean it's uh it's a very interesting year for for athletes uh first of all let's talk about what kind of year it's been 2020 was supposed to be this massive year for athletes around the globe uh it's the olympics and um you know then COVID happened nobody nobody saw that coming no one could have predicted that COVID would happen but it did and that kind of blew everybody's plans right away for you personally how did you take all of this and how did you have to suddenly planning your year around all of your year around the Olympics, then now you have to readjust. Um, so I think like everyone else, I was faced with the initial shock of, you know, training for the whole year, looking forward to it and, you know, everything just lining up to that moment. But then once it happened, I think for me, what was necessary was to take a moment to really think about what's going on and realizing that this is happening to everyone in the world. That's the first thing. Yeah. But also it gave me an opportunity to be grateful for the moment and, you know, really take a step back and think about the other things that I want to do and really have the space to start doing those things. So I, 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 I initially started with shock, but then I kind of got, you know, got ready to do the things that I want to do. I have the space, I have the time, let's get to it. So yeah. right now it's just been really, you know, focusing on trying to do the other things that I'm interested in and also, you know, trying to get back to training. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and that's a very, uh, uh, that's a very weird uh, thing to do, to try to readjust. And it, it, because I think 2020, massive year for a lot of athletes around the globe. But let's talk about how you've tried to keep fit. I mean, we've seen, at least post all sorts of workout routines. Uh, I think I've seen a video of you running stairs. I mean, how have you had to reinvent your training routines to try and stay fit despite all of this? Um, luckily for me, I have a gym in my apartment building. So I've been able to do that, um, use the gym in my apartment building, but the tracks are not open. Yeah. It took a while for the public parks to be open, like all that stuff. So it's just, I, I mean, initially when I started, everything was closed. So not even my apartment gym. So I was trying to do stuff in my apartment, trying to go outside, run on the street, little things like that. that. But keeping everything in mind and keeping the fact that the season um, had changed, I was, a, I was a little bit more forgiven if I wasn't able to, you know, get a workout in or do something. So, yeah. but now things are a little bit better because I have the gym, I'm using the bike and doing little things like that. But I'm, I've been in the sport long enough to know how my body feels and how my body should feel and how I can adjust and modify things. So yeah. it hasn't been too, too bad. Okay. I mean, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, and I'm sure uh, later on in the show, we will talk a lot more about what you've been up to and all of the, the other stuff you've been doing outside of even the track and field itself. Um, but let's talk about competing for Ghana. I mean, the last time you were here, we spoke about the, some of the challenges that athletes go through. And it feels like it feels kind of repetitive sometimes because you, you speak about the same things over and over and over uh, and over again and nothing seems to change. But let's talk about uh, your you competing for Ghana. You've been doing this for, what, nearly 10 years now. Um, you've won gold medals uh, for yeah. Ghana at the African Games, or the African Championships. When you look back at this journey, what are some of the highlights that you can pinpoint to and say, this is probably why I chose to do track and field? It's so funny because I was thinking about our conversation earlier about college and how you don't really remember the big things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think for me, it's 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 been about the moments where I've been able to make a statement for the country. So not even you would think it, it's about like the 
African Championship medal and, you know, those little things, but it really isn't. It's been in the spaces where, you know, people have asked me over and over again, why would you compete for Ghana? Why would you compete for Ghana? Yeah. But it's been in the spaces where I've been able to create opportunities for other people because I compete for Ghana, yeah. you know, because yeah. I was, you know, I'm, I'm doing something that's unconventional. Mm -hmm. And so that has opened a lot of doors for me. And, and I think th those are the big things where I'm able to put Ghana on the map in a real impactful way. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to remember if I came in 2018 or 2017, I don't remember, but between then and now there's been so many that so many things that have happened for me, you know, and yeah. opportunities that have come my way because of this journey that I've been on. Yeah. And so for me, those are the big things. And of course, I mean, getting the medal is cool, but I think being able to do something with a medal, being able to do something impactful with a medal yeah. um, is what's, it's what's been really important. Okay. Uh, I mean, and, and for you coming up, um, trying to be an athlete. And last time we had this conversation about uh, facilities and we talk about them all the time. Um, before 2008, uh, when the Accra Sports Stadium was renovated to host the Africa Cup of Nations, it had running trucks. Our works running trucks were also in wonderful shape. Today, if you take the whole of the greater Accra region, uh, when the stadium was renovated, the trucks were removed from the Accra Sports Stadium. So no more trucks there. The Elwak Sports Stadium, mm -hmm. uh, the trucks are basically now just a bare floor because there are barely any trucks mm -hmm. in there. So in other words, the entire greater Accra region, if anybody wants to take up running as a sport, there are no trucks for them to run on except at the University of Ghana, uh, which is also a closed facility. How important is this? Um, I mean, how, how do you think this is going to affect the, the kind of athletes that are coming up in the country? Do you think that it's a factor contributing to a lack of quality athletes in the last, let's say, five years? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's a direct fact. It's a direct correlation because if you think about it is, I mean, where are we investing at, what are we investing in, right? Yeah. And that's where the benefits are going to be. And so if we're not investing in the facilities, if you're not investing in the resources, then of course, there's nothing that's going to come out of it. We're going to have the most talented people, which I believe we do. We have the most talented people, the most talented athletic people in the world. And none of that is going to be cultivated. And that's an issue that I've always had from the start. It's just you know, no one's really invested in the grassroots at the grassroots level yeah. in what we can do to, you know, to create talent in our own continent and to create talent in our country. And that's, I mean, that's the core of the issue. But I think that issue also stems from a mindset that there really isn't a benefit in investing in that talent, which right. is obviously contrary to the truth, you know. And so, and 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 that's where the problem starts. Is that there really isn't. Um, the, the, the thought that, you know, investing in that talent, investing in athletics can really contribute to other benefits for the country. Yeah. And in my experience and what athletics has done for me and how that shaped me as a person and been able to create this life for me where I'm creating opportunities for other people, yeah. um, imagine how much more we can get of that from the continent. Yeah. I mean, and that's a wonderful thing that you, 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 you spoke about, uh, the opportunities that, uh, that athletics has it's given you. But also, it's, it, it goes without saying that you have those opportunities now because you've put yourself in the position to be able to embrace them. And I'm talking about education here. What is the recipe to successfully combining college education with athletics? And in your case, going to an Ivy school, an Ivy League school and still be able to compete at the highest level and winning gold medals for Ghana? Yeah, so I think for me, I've been blessed enough that I have parents who are very supportive in everything that I do. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people think that as humans, we should be very one dimensional, mm -hmm. meaning you have one thing that you're good at and you focus on that. And for me, growing up, my parents had always been like, you can be good at 20 different things. Just be really good at it. And so whenever I, my recipe, I would say for that is whenever I'm doing something, I'm 110% focused on that thing. Right. And then when I'm doing the next thing, I'm 110% focused on that thing, not worried about 
how this influences that or what it's just when I'm here, I'm here. Mm. So I'm also a visual artist. I paint, I do all these different <laughs> things, wow. but it's because when I'm doing it, I'm doing just that. I'm yeah. not thinking about anything else. I'm, I, I give my all into everything I'm doing in that moment. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's been, what's been able to shape me in that way. And, you know, made it possible to balance everything I was doing because I was very protective of my time right. and very protective of the things that I'm investing in. So if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to waste my time. Mm. That's just my thing. If I'm going to do it, I'm not going to waste my time. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to try to be the best that I can be at it. If I, in that moment that I'm doing it. So that's, that's been the, the main thing. Okay, uh, and and uh, let's talk about on the same tangent. Um, the the GAA, the Ghana Athletics Association, they've done a lot to secure a lot of scholarships for up and coming athletes to go to the US uh, and train, go to school there and train there. Um, do you think ultimately that's the way to go? That it's not possible for us to for our athletes to 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 try and go professional at some point, um, but you know. The best we can do for them is get them scholarships to U.S. schools, for example. It's unfortunate that that's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that we have to go that route. And, you know, the best we can do is get them education um, to a U.S. school. Why can't we create the culture around that in Ghana? You mm. know what I mean? That I like... We have... I mean, we, we have money in Ghana. You can see what Ghana invests money into. And, and why can't we do that where we're building a culture around sports, where we're using sports to educate people? Because not everyone's going to have that opportunity to be recruited by a Division I school, a Division II, a Div you know, Division II school, and go to school in the U.S. It's not everyone that's going to happen, that's going to happen for. And so sometimes it makes you wonder what, why can't we create those infrastructures in Ghana where people who have talent in other things, in a multitude of things, not just sports, right. but are able to balance the two and are able to get opportunities because of that, mm. you know? And, and the reason being is that there are not enough people like myself who are trying to do that and show the world that it's possible to do that. Right. And right. so everyone's leaving to go outside to go create opportunity, rightfully so. But I think the more and more people like myself are coming back home and making impact in that way and creating those opportunities there, yeah. the easier it's going to be. I don't want to rely on the NCAA for people to succeed um, yeah. in sports. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, unfortunately, that's the that it looks like that's the that's the only route to go now uh, from the Ghanaian point of view. But let's talk more about uh, competition here. Uh, you have qualified for the Olympics uh, already. You did that in Jamaica, I believe. Then you got injured in the process. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, but. I mean, how important is it for you to always qualify way ahead of time? Because, and I ask this question because as it stands now, uh, as of March, which was three months to the Olympic Games, Ghana had only five athletes who had qualified. Yourself, uh, Joseph Amor, two boxers, and then one powerlifter. So that was it. With three months to the Olympics, more than 60% of the qualifying series were already over. And so I, I, I'm not sure why, as a country, we're always scrambling at, at the last minute to try and get people to qualify. But talk me through how important is it for athletes to have the qualification time way too early and then start to concentrate on the other stuff? Yeah, so I think it's a multitude, it's a multi, a multitude of factors here. I don't think it's that people are scrambling to qualify at the last minute. That's not the choice. Mm. <laughs> it just so happens that way. And it all goes back to resources that are available to most people. And so I think a lot of the times um, people underestimate, you know, having a training facility that supports you all year round, right. having competitions to go to that, you know, you're able to work on this stuff that you need to do all year round. And so there's so many things. And I think what we're seeing is not that people are last minute, but it's, it's really the, the limited resources that's playing a factor here. Yeah. And so the limited resources are, you know, causing people to not necessarily be in peak shape, peak for performance early on, mm -hmm. and they just need a lot more time to get to that level. So it's, it's not really the athletes or the country. It's just limited resources leading to all of that. Okay. Uh, that's fair enough. Let's talk about... Um, 
the event that you compete in. And just last weekend, there was a huge rage on the internet when during the Monaco Diamond League, when the long jump uh, formula for determining the champion was changed. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, where the, the one that jumps the furthest no longer wins the competition yeah. if you don't jump the furthest uh, as a top three member. What do you make of that particular rule change? Because it got a lot of people very confused. I think, honestly, it really changes the nature of the sport. It really, really does. Um, because now you're taking opportunities. There are some people that are last jump performers. Right. And, you know, they come out on the last jump. They may be in eighth place. And then on the last jump, they bump up to third or bump up to second or something like that. And there are people that are like that. Yeah. And I think it takes away the excitement. It takes away the unpredictable uh, unpredictability of the sport. Right. It really takes away a lot from it because I think from, for, from an athlete's perspective, we get a lot of energy from, you know, the possibility that you can, at any moment, you could be the one at the top. Yeah. You know, and so I think it really changes the nature in a way that, I don't know if it's going to last because it, it really changes the nature of the sport and, 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 and the way, you know, the way things should be and the excitement about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and it's uh, because even from a journalist's point of view, it's, uh, it's, that's just, it's just very strange. But I guess that a lot of, a lot of things take, take getting used to it uh, in the end. So we'll see what happens about that. But also... Um, when you, look at, when you take a look at the track and field space in Ghana at the moment, I'm not sure, how, I mean, I know you compete with all of these other people, but I'm not sure how much attention you actually pay to their performances. But are there some up-and-coming athletes that you've looked at and you've told yourself, if we put the right things in place, maybe these guys have some future for Ghana's lessons? Um, not necessarily, because unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be something that's going to happen over the next four years or even 10 years, to be honest. Right. Um, so I haven't, I don't, I'll just, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really pay attention to sports outside of me competing as much as I should. Yeah. Um, just because I, in, in the beginning, I say I did. When I started the sport, when I was younger in the sport, I did. But now it's just I'm so occupied with so many other things that I'm doing that it's just in and out for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think I think on the on the later on the back end of your question, I do think that, that you know even if we invest start investing now, we're not going to see that benefit for another decade. Right. Right. And that's just the truth of the matter. So it's just going to take time, but it has to start at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, you know that's a that's a very interesting point that you make, and that's why I I, I want to I want us to talk about this uh, next. One of the things that um, that is happening all around sport is always seeing a lot of former athletes coming back into the sport uh, in some capacity um, to help shape the sport in the way they want to see it uh, look like. Mm -hmm. From your point of view, and I know you're you're. You, you do all kinds of things, marketing, administrative, what have you. You're really good with that kind of stuff. Now, last week or two weeks ago, there was an interview of Ignatius Geza who said that he, he said this was necessary um, to push the sport forward, having quality administrators in place who can rightly lobby for the right investment. And he said that he would be ready to come back to the country uh, to occupy some capacity in trying to make that happen. I know you do your own kinds of things, but is this something you've thought about? Coming back to the country at some point and try to shape the sport uh, to what you want to see it be? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's always been the plan for me, and for me, even sooner than later. Yeah. Um, that's really the plan. Like, you know, I, I'm not just preaching it. <laughs> Um, it's, it's something that I'm invested in, in putting steps in place to transition into that. Right. Um, and, and I think, I think like he's right on it's having the administrators who are there, who, you know, have, you know, the vision to really change the, the game, but also really, I think there's a cultural mindset that needs to change right. and the cultural mindset that's going to change is rooted in someone being the token. And being, you know, a testament of what can really happen if yeah. we invest into athletics or if we invest into our homegrown talent. 
Right. And, and, and that's what you're, you're doing in your own small way, isn't it? Um, you've put together a wonderful event, Accelerate, where you're trying to get a lot of former athletes to come together and speak to the up-and-coming athletes and even those still in the game about lots of other issues and how they can manage themselves now and after the sport. Um, I don't want to say everything about this event, but you tell me <laughs> what Accelerate is all about and what inspired you to put that together. Okay, so Accelerate, Accelerate is actually my company, mm -hmm. um, and the event is called Accelerating Success. Okay. Um, so basically, Accelerate, the idea for Accelerate has evolved over the last 10 years. Okay. So I've always had a passion of using sports as some way to provide opportunities to educate people, to provide opportunities for mentorship, and so on and so forth. And I mean, we talk about 10 years, it's just a matter of me getting experience and getting the right network and, you know, a lot of other things to make it happen. Yeah. But Accelerate really, the mission of Accelerate at its core is to provide athletes an opportunity to educate themselves and to provide them the network that's necessary to transfer the skill set that they have in the sports. Yeah. I think a lot of the times athletes, are so good at the sport, so good at what they do, but they lack the confidence to do other things. Right. And unfortunately, the sport is only a short window. Yeah. Right. And so I remember when I started competing for Ghana and where's the time gone? You know what I mean? Right. And so really what we're trying to do is starting to equip athletes with the resources that are necessary to help them translate, you know, the skill set that they have in the sports and in, 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 into doing things beyond the sport, but also really teaching them how to brand themselves. And I'm not talking about Instagram branding or, you know, branding yourself for a sponsor. It's right. how do you brand yourself? How do you create opportunities and leverage the experiences that you've had as an athlete hmm. to create opportunities for yourself that you can translate those experiences effectively and really give you more opportunities professionally? Right. You know what I mean? And so that's what the, the mission of, of the company is and using using various outlets to do that. Right. And, and um, the accelerating success event that we're doing this weekend right. it's a, it's a it's a we, we're calling it a fireside chat ah. um, but more so a, a webinar where we're having very successful athletes american okay. athletes so to speak um who've been able to really brand themselves and create opportunities because the truth of the matter even at the highest level nfl nba players who sign multi-million dollar contracts right within five years of retirement about 70 percent of them go broke Ooh. And you wonder why that is. Somebody who's coming in and make, signing a $20 million contract a year, mm -hmm. why are they going broke after they're done? So it's not even about giving them the money. It's really about teaching them. And we're not doing any financial education or anything like that. But it's really about teaching them, how do I see myself as an athlete, but also brand myself in a way that right. I can translate everything to continue making money when I'm done, you know, to continue creating opportunities for myself when I'm done. Yeah. Because a lot of the times athletes lose relevance. So we have Marcellus Wiley, who's an NFL, um, all pro, all pro defensive. And um, he also went to Columbia, actually. Okay. Um, he's now a TV host on Fox Sports. He has his own show on Fox Sports. He has his own, wow. he's a, his own company. Yeah. We have Nate Robinson, who's a, a NBA player still playing right now. Mm. He's an entrepreneur as well. Um, and he has his own clothing line. We have Natasha Hastings, who's also a U.S. Olympic gold medalist. She's right. also an entrepreneur, has her own makeup line. And then we have Nexinga Prescott, who's a U.S. fencer. And she's an advisor for ENY, Ernst & Young. I don't know if you know of them, but, right. um, but she's also more so on the corporate side and how she translated her brand as an athlete to create opportunities for herself in right. the corporate world. Mm. And so really, it's, it's, it's hearing from these people from the highest level, the NFL, who make tons of money, NBA yeah. making tons of money. So the yeah. sports that no one is even paying attention to and how these people have been able to really leverage that brand to yeah. create opportunities. And honestly, this applies to everybody. It's not just athletes. Right. It's as a human being, it, how can you brand yourself so that when you walk in the room, you're maximizing the opportunity of being in that space? Right. You know, every opportunity that you could possibly get with whatever you're doing, you're getting it in that space. Yeah. And so that's really what the focus of the event is. And we hope to follow up with a, with various workshops to teach, you know, athletes various skills, such as networking, how do you build your brand, building, uh, telling your story, 
and really how do you how do you create this community around you that can support your vision and you know facilitate the process yeah. of you becoming this professional and dynamic person mm. i mean that, that is that sounds really wonderful and and as you put it this isn't just for 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 athletes or you know track and field athletes it could be for footballers it could be for yes, pretty everybody. much anybody uh, i mean and how this is happening this uh, saturday i believe Yes, it's Saturday um, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. So I think that's probably 6 p.m. Ghana time. Yeah, 5, 5, 5, 5 p.m. Ghana time. Yeah. Okay, I think it might be 5. Actually, no, you're fine. Oh, wait, right, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Yeah. 7 p.m. Ghana time. 6 to 7 p.m. Yeah. 6 to 7 p.m. Um, 6 to 7 Ghana p.m. time. Okay. Um, so, so it will be happening at that time. Um, you, the registration is on the website accelerate.info slash register. Mm. And Accelerate is A-X-X-E-L-E-R-A-T-E dot info slash register. And so anyone can register. We welcome anyone because honestly, it's also an opportunity to network. So if yeah, you're trying to yeah. branch into the sports industry, yeah. what, you know, having those people that are already doing those things are in the spaces that you want to do and you can ask them questions. It's going to be a Q&A style format, um, being able to interact with them, ask them questions, hear their story. And, and really, you know, being part of this Accelerate community, we're going to provide job opportunities, internships opportunities. It's just mm. a whole lot of things that we have in store. So we're really excited. And, and this is also very competitive, isn't it? Uh, for, for, because the early bed catches the worm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it what, you mean competitive in what sense? For who? <laughs> uh, I mean, try to get in first so it doesn't, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have numbers about limits, how many people you want. Yeah, so I mean, our target, our target is ideally a hundred people. Um, so it's going to be the first hundred people that hop on. <laughs> um, come, uh, so basically, our target is to, to have at least a hundred people on it. And okay. um, yeah, it's it's it's. I think it's it's going to be a very informative, substantive session. And honestly, anyone who wants to be in the sports industry. Um, wants to work in the sports industry as a student of sports, as an athlete, as a coach, whatever you may be, it's a great opportunity to really find out how these athletes have been able to leverage their brand um, for success. Okay, so we are still here on the track at chatting with Nadia Ekegane's triple jump record holder. We will take a very short break. When we come back, we'll zoom straight into targets for the Olympic Games and how Ghana can transform its athletic space. Stay with us. Have you heard of Wheel of Fortune? No, what's that? Register on betplanet.com.gh. Uh -huh. Select Wheel of Fortune and right. win a prize. What? Wait, I'm just going to win a prize because I'm new? Yes, but to win a prize, you only deposit 10 Ghana CD. Before I win, I have to pay. Really? So you're comparing 10 Ghana CD to an iPhone, an iPad, 25,000 Ghana CD? Eh? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay, okay then, okay, then, speak. Babe, we are ready! We are ready! Election 2020, Ghana makes a choice. Tracking and bringing reports of the presidential and parliamentary campaigns across the length and breadth of this nation. Analyzing campaign activities and election data with our panelists on the Voters' Diary. The Voters' Diary is the most factual, instructive, and balanced election 2020 analysis program on television. The Voters' Diary, every weekday on City TV from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Stay informed on all the relevant issues on election 2020. Tune into the Voters' Diary, it's Ghana's choice.
All right, welcome back. This is The Tracker here on CTTV. My name is Fentio Tahiri Fentio. My guest today is Nadia Eke, Ghana's triple jump record holder. And I stressed on that because it's not easy for anybody to be a record holder in any event for an entire country. So, I mean, congratulations, Nadia, on that. And, you know, I, I, I keep talking because I have, I, have, I have covered the African Games. I've covered the World Championships. And each time I have missed you, and I've covered the African Championships, and each time I have missed you. I was in, uh, in Nigeria in 2018, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> I was in uh, Doha, you weren't there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not sure why that keeps happening. But when you, let's talk about com your career as a competitor for Ghana from uh, you know, the triple jump uh, point of view. Of all the competitions you've been to, which one would you say, and I know this might be too obvious, but which one would you say has been the one that you've had the most success in or that you've had the most fun in competing in? To be perfectly honest, it's not as obvious as you think. Oh, okay. I would have just said Durban 2016. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the qualifying <laughs> performance. I can tell you that. All right. I would say the one I had the most fun in and in competing was the um so my previous record was 13.93 right and that was in saint martin in 2018 no 2017 mm -hmm. i believe um and i think that was the most that was the best performance i had mm. because i had i think i had i fouled five of my six jumps wow and the worst jump was the one that was my 1393. Oh, wow. And so I had a jump in there that was well over 1440. You know, I, I was just on point. And and you're so on fire. for me, and that, that was the moment that I really, I was on fire. <laughs> um, that was the moment that I realized that, you know, I'm capable of a lot. There's a lot that I can do. Yeah. Um, and it, it was just the moment that it became clear to me about what I have in my hands as far as talent and um, and what I can do with hard work. And so that's that's the me most memorable one for me. Well, yeah. Um, and uh, let's talk about some of the, let's talk about specifics here, because I, I think in the 2018, for example, so that was, that performance you talked about was the, in the previous year. I know for at least a lot can change in a year, even in a month, a lot can change. But you were going into the Commonwealth Games in 2018 with that sort of form from the previous mm -hmm. year. What really happened in, uh, in, in, in Australia? So I had changed my coach, oh. actually. Hmm. So I changed my coach. So after that performance, I moved to Athens, Georgia to train with a different coach. Um, just because New York was not the place to train as far as financially. And at that point, I was only training financially and everything. It just didn't make any sense. So I moved right. to Athens, Georgia um, to train with a new coach and my, he changed my technique. Oh. So I was at a place where I wasn't comfortable with the new technique yet. Mm. Um, but it was one of those things that I wasn't comfortable with it. And if I hit it, I jump well. If I didn't right. hit it, I wouldn't jump well. <laughs> so it was something as little as that. And it was just an off day where I wasn't hitting the right, you know, positions and stuff like that. And yeah. it happens to the best of, you know, every athlete. It, it happens. You know, yeah. you have you, you you feel like you're in tip top shape and, you know, one thing is different and that's just it. Yeah. And so for me, it was just not being able to revert back to my old and comfortable technique in that moment because I was in a crucial in between stage where I wasn't completely um, accustomed to the new way, but I right. also kind of knew the old way, but not enough to go back to it fully. So it was just a, it was just a bad, you know, off day for me. And, you know, we yeah. move forward and here we are in 2020 and we've qualified. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. So what happened in between really doesn't matter. The destination is it's the, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the ultimate goal. Um, but let's stay in Australia, but this time off the track, you know, of the jumping pit, the landing pit matters. I mean, we were here in Ghana and we hear all sorts of stories about what was going on and bonus rows. These are usually things we are accustomed to hearing about when it comes to our almighty black stars. But then in Australia, we hear Butcher in Kebetin captain is sending speeches out. And I mean, what was, what was that really about? And how can we 
prevent these sorts of things to allow athletes to be able to concentrate when they go for competitions so they don't have to pay attention to whatever is happening outside of uh, the sport itself. Okay, so I'm hoping you can tell me what was going on because I don't know. <laughs> but but honestly, here's the thing. I think that one, I would say I would say one, you know how Ghanaians are. Right. So there have been stories about me saying that I was overweight and I did this and Nadia is this and Nadia is not even Ghanaian. So if you really listen to everything that everyone always says and takes it as truth, right. you will never get anywhere. Right. You know, and so for me, it's it's just unfortunate that our country always has something negative mm -hmm. to say and something negative that's happening. That's one part of it. The other part of it is when I go to compete, just like, I mean, I'm there to compete. So I'm not thinking about anything else. And your question is, how can we get athletes to focus on what they're there? They're there to compete. And so... I may be different, but for me, when I'm there to compete, I'm there to compete. That's what I'm telling you. Like, I don't even know what right. was going on. Right. Because my mind was just on, I'm here to do what I came to do. Um, and if I, I've said this before, but if, if, if I'm not there to do my best, I'm not there for per diem. Right. You know, per diem is not going to change anything I've done up until that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's 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 cool to get it, but it's not going to change the training that you've done on up until that point. And if you're only doing it for the per diem, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons because track and field is not the most paying sport. So you know that's that's the thing that I would say. I just think that as as a country, we really need to change the tone. We need to change the expectation, and that goes back to the whole thing I'm saying about a cultural mindset that needs to happen. Right. You know how are we? speaking about our athletes how are we speaking about the events our athletes go to how are we supporting our athletes mm. and i think right now there's this thing of you know there, it always has to be negativity if it's not negative then no one's talking about it yeah yeah and that's unfortunate i agree quite unfortunate because i think for the media we have a, a responsibility ourselves because you know mm -hmm. you project more of the positives then corporate institutions can feel more comfortable uh, to want to come and support. But let's talk about at least themselves and then add in value. You have an Ivy League degree, very well educated, very well spoken. You have a very solid brand. We can't say the same for a lot more people that have been in your position before. And I say your position in terms of people who have competed for Ghana at the national mm -hmm. level. How do you at least get to the place where they are able, and that's what you're trying to use Accelerate to do. But for you personally, yeah. how, how do you think that the athletes that are coming up in Ghana can add a lot more value to themselves uh, to reach a place where they can become brands on their own? Right now, they're just, they're just athletes. How can they become brands? Right. The funny thing about it is I think athletes are the hardest people to convince about this point that I'm trying to make yeah. um, and the fact is you have to be more than just the athlete that you have to view yourself as more than that right. and you 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 know I've had I even had people that are teammates that like will go to world championship and it's like no they, they want to stay in the room the whole time or you know they just want to go eat and you know go back to their room and get ready for competition and no you're not there just to compete mm. you never know who you're going to meet and I think Ghanaians in general, not even just an athletic scope, Ghanaians in general have this modest way of being where, you know, you don't talk too much or you don't, you're not too outspoken, you're not too loud. And I'm against everything about that, you know, because people need to hear your story. People need to hear what you're really about. And I think as athletes, people, athletes need to start thinking of themselves as I'm really about more than just the sport. And how can I get other people to care about what I care about? Yeah. And so if I'm, if I'm an athlete and I'm a singer, I need the world to know that I also sing. When I go to a track meet, I'm not just competing. I'm meeting with people like, hey, I sing too. Right. You know, I'm a painter. I do this too. I do all these other things too. And it's really about showing people that you are more than one dimensional. Right. You're dynamic. You can do anything. And that's what attracts people to your story because I think... For a lot of people, I mean, even in America, people don't believe that people can be multi-talented. Mm. And, 
you know, when people see you as an athlete, they automatically put you in a box. You're an athlete. That's it. That's all you do. (laughs) But the moment you're able to show them, and I think for me, what I've been able to do really well is show people that I'm capable of way more. Yeah. I can do so yeah. much more. I can add so much value in what you're doing. Yeah. And so one of the, one an example of that is I, I consult with the University of Miami, the School of Law. Right. And I'm not a lawyer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I have an expertise that they don't have. Right. And I bring a very different perspective, you know, in their entertainment and sports law program and from the athlete's perspective, who they're trying to serve. And I occupy that space and occupy that space fully. But that's because I've made the effort to show hey i have more than just my athletic ability i have other things i can bring to the table Mm -hmm. and so it's really about thinking yourself about that and sorting those opportunities if you're in school really focusing on that too being in school doing what you need to do in school when you're doing other things focusing on that and then making sure you're doing it because you never know where your eggs may your eggs may fall you know you just do all that you can and just let it all happen by uh, organically so to speak yeah, I mean, you talk about our modesty. They say we're what, we're we're the Canadians of Africa, <laughs> and so we just like. To... <laughs> yeah, and it's not. It's not a good thing. It is it's not, not a good thing. thing. It's, not, it's a not a good thing. thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, but let's talk about the Olympics itself. You're going again, and I want to talk about something else before we talk about the performance itself and what your targets are going to Tokyo next year and what the one year extra that you have could do to you in terms of preparations and all of that. Uh, I know that financially it's difficult for, for athletes, especially Ghanaian athletes who, are, who don't have contracts with um, you know, clothing lines or sporting apparel companies like Nike or Puma. Uh, you still need money to be able to compete. Luckily for some of you, you have the Olympic scholarship, which has now been extended for another one year. Come Tokyo 2020, well, now 2021, the, at the end of that, the scholarship will expire. Do you, Perhaps from your point of view, is that something that you want to continue to stay on and continue to compete? Or you've given yourself some serious thoughts about what you want to do post the Olympic Games in 2021? Yeah, um, for me, <laughs> let's be honest, the Olympic scholarship is not enough to right. sustain anybody, yeah. you know, maybe in Ghana, but not in America. So that's just getting that off the bat. So oftentimes you have to be invested in other things to create opportunities for yourself. Right. Um, I think personally, I don't plan on being on the Olympic scholarship um, post 2021 just because i think i need to make room for other people to have the opportunity for that um i i it's i mean that's pretty much why i stand on that i'm already working on things that i want to do beyond the sport i'm always doing that i've always been doing that i work full-time i do all these other things so um it's just a matter of translating that and really evaluating where i am there um at the end of 2021 um, physically, mentally, and then deciding what's the next step, if I'm going to still compete or if, you know, it's time to fully invest into, you yeah. know, my other endeavors. So there's a, what you're saying is that there's a real chance that uh, after the Olympic Games, you might retire from the sport? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, if you did, you would have paid your dues anyway, uh, to be honest, because... I'm not sure we, um, the, the, the last time any African has won, uh, any Ghanaian, sorry, has won the gold medal at the African Championships level. The, the last gold medal that uh, we won was from the African Games. And we all know the African Games, the level there is not the same as the level at the African Championships because the championships, pretty much everybody is there. So I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, the last African Championships in 2018, Janet won silver in the 100 meters, but that's about it. But I think from your gold medal from 2016 is still the only African championship gold medal we've won in the last four years. So that is, so if you were to step down right now, it was still, you know, you would still have paid your dues. Having said that, going to Tokyo, what would be, what are, what's your thinking like? What is, you have some personal goals and, uh, but in, before even talk here, just tell me about what this one year extra could do to someone like you who is so busy doing other stuff. So now you have more time to train. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, honestly, though, I think 
I, I look at everything as a blessing in disguise and everything happens for a reason, right? Yeah. And so for me, I had, I mean, it's been what, 10 years of co trying to compete or at least competing every, ye the whole year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been like that for the last 10 years. And I think my body needs a break. So to have one year where I don't have to compete at all, it's it's a blessing. Yeah. And who knows what that's going to mean in terms of performance for me. If this is the break that I needed all along, yeah. you know, to let things heal and let things reboot and recover and everything like that. So I'm really excited to see where my fitness is um, once we start training again. Um, and as far as goals for the games, I, I say this all the time. It's just... I, I think I think I've been in the sport long enough to have a composure. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm just going in to perform at the best that I can, and yeah. that's all I can do. Because at the end of the day, I, and I'll say this again: at the end of the day, no one no one's really funding my training, right? You right. know, except for myself. And so at the end of the day, I'm going to make myself happy first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, make myself happy first because. When I when I, when I don't perform well, it, it comes on me as well. So, yes, I'm representing Ghana, but Nadia comes first, yeah. and that's just the truth, you know. So I'm just I'm I'm there to perform the best that I can. Obviously, try to beat my personal best and see where that you know where that brings me. Okay, I mean I mean that's very well said, uh, Nadia. Let's talk about uh, uh, and and this is going to be the the last leg of our conversation. I want us to talk about the sports of athletics in general. And you've alluded to it many times in this conversation about how athletics is not the most lucrative and how difficult it is and what have you. From the 10 years since you entered the sport, at the time you entered the sport and what has happened between then and now, what do you make of the sport itself and where it is now? Is there progress? Are they progressing? Are there new changes coming? And there are a lot of changes coming in. What do you make of the sport of athletics? Is it as enticing as it was when you got in first? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What has and, changed? I, and I'll tell you, I'll give you two reasons why. Okay. The first reason being Usain Bolt brought the money to the sport. Right. Right? And now he's gone. So he left with a lot of money <laughs> from the sport. Um, that's the one big thing. And so that changed a lot of, you know, opportunities in the space because now people are not going to the Olympics to watch Bolt. Right. People would go to world championships to watch Bolt, you know, so there was money there, but now you're there. The athletes are at a disadvantage because there's not a lot of money. So we're looking at contracts and the contracts that people have are, is not much. Mm. On, on average, it's not much. And so, I mean, there really isn't as much opportunity for athletes to begin with. And now that Bolt has left, the opportunities are even less because no one's really paying attention to the sport in the same way that they were before. And then with a lot of the changes that are happening, I don't believe that it's in the athlete's best interest. So for example, now with the point system, right? right. It's basically, if you perform well, it has to be at a certain type of meet, right. a certain type of competition that's yep. ranked highly to get the maximum point. So even if I go to a competition that I'm able to afford to get to because it's local and I jump the best jump in the world, mm. it won't count as much as somebody else who got to go to a Diamond League. Right. And guess what? The people who get to go to Diamond League already have a contract already have the best performances, already have an agent. So what it does is it creates a divide between the very, very elite people and those who that are not elite yet. And it really makes it even harder for the people who are not elite yet to climb into that elite, you know, window. Yeah. And then when you look at sports, I mean, events like triple jump, you know, like the hammer throw or javelin or those type of events where people are not even watching as much, right. it's, the divide is even bigger. You know, and, and, and then even the top people in those events don't even make enough to make the divide make sense. Right, right, <laughs> um, so right. I think what it, what's happening more, it's, it's creating, there's less opportunity as a developmental athlete to make it into the top. Hmm. Is that, I mean, and this is a very interesting point that you make, because then it means that the, the very elite continue to remain there. And then when they go, there's not enough quality to replace them in the case of Bolt. But at the same time, exactly. do you think that puts pressure on a lot of the upcoming athletes to try 
and cheat their way in, so to speak. Because, you know, like you're saying, if that is all you do, you just have to make it. You don't make it into the elite, you're done. There's no middle ground. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I don't know. I don't know to what extent in terms of that topic that goes. But to be honest, I think more athletes are becoming aware of this fact, the reality of the sport, that yeah. there really isn't much in it in terms of, you know, revenue generating and not, not as many people are watching. And so I think... I think beyond the cheating your way into it, I think people are, are are dealing with the realities of it firsthand, and and I think it's I think you're seeing more and more people leave the sport. Hmm. 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 That's that's interesting. Also, uh, there's something I want to pick your mind on because I know you probably know about this. Um, one of the reasons the the Diamond League and the World Athletics is making all of the changes, especially at the Diamond League level, for example, is because they think that uh, the attention span of people is reducing, so let's, let's cut some of the events. Let's, uh, and in the process, what they've done is they've cut some of the events that the African athletes excel at. 10,000 meters has been taking off the Diamond League calendar, mm -hmm. 5,000 meters, the same thing. At a time when it happened, there was a lot of rage from African journalists, um, African athletes who thought that the one thing or the two things that the Africans are really good at, that's where you're taking off the money zone, which is the Diamond League. I mean, when you heard it, what, what was your reaction to, to, these, to, to all of these changes that directly somehow affects majority of Africans, really? Let's be honest here. Yeah, I think for me, and this is maybe, this is just a personal opinion. I think a lot of these policies reflect about, you know, power, race and power in sports. Right. And that's a big thing that nobody wants to talk about. Um, and, and in the African continent, because we're all black, everyone's like, oh, you know, it's not a big deal, but it is. Yeah. And that to me is a, a clear example of that. Limiting exposure limits opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, if we're shedding the light less on African people, then we own the African narrative. Right. And that's been the story for centuries. Right. You know, you see all this African art in all these museums and it's like, where did you get it from? Right. 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 It's the same thing. And so it's, it's the same thing, only in a different means. And to me, it's funny because now is the time to talk about those things right. because of everything that's going on Agreed. and the tension around racism and everything like that. But I think that's, that's a clear example of how power and race play in the sports and the inequities of the sport. Right. Right. Okay. Well, this has been a, a massive pleasure. We could, could keep the conversation going, but I woke you up too early, way too early. So <laughs> we're going to cut it. Um, but um, before you go, any last words that you want to share with us regarding Accelerate or anything else really that you want to say? Um, no, not really. It's just, yeah. it's just keep an eye out. Nadia is not done yet. Keep an eye out for Nadia. Um, and, and, and really, I'm, I'm just excited about a lot of the things that I'm working on. And I'm really pushing Ghanaians and pushing, you know, the higher people, the people in higher places to really support at yeah. the ground, at the grassroots level, really yeah. support. If, you know, we're trying to make people from the, in the diaspora come back home, let's make that opportunity across the board and really support those that are out there doing various things and, you know, bringing back our home talent and cult cultivating our home talent. All right. Future GAA or GOC president, Nadia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Yeah, and all the best on Saturday as well. Thank you. Have a good one. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. So Nadia, I care. our guest today on The Tracker, speaking to us on a variety of issues. This has been The Tracker Live on City TV. My name is Fentio Tahir Fentio. Until next time, thanks for your time and bye-bye.